Hello everybody, this is Dr. Tani Isa, professor of pathology. I make these videos for all medical students. Hope someone may find it helpful. We are talking about amyloidosis. We talked about the definition of amyloidosis, the physical nature of amyloid, the chemical nature of amyloid, and we talked about classification of amyloidosis. And in a separate video, we talked about the pathogenesis of amyloidosis. And in the previous video, we talked about the morphology of amyloidosis, organs affected, and the gross pathology, and the microscopic pathology. In this video, we are going to talk about the clinical picture and the prognosis of amyloidosis. So what is the clinical picture of amyloidosis? Amyloidosis may be found with no clinical manifestation, may be completely asymptomatic or just found as microscopic change with no clinical manifestations, or it may be fatal. And this depends upon the degree of the deposit and the site or the organ affected. Clinical manifestations at first are non-specific, maybe just weakness, weight loss, lightheadedness, or syncope. But later on, it appears related to the organ affected. You may find renal, cardiac, and gastrointestinal involvement symptoms to denote renal involvement or cardiac or gastrointestinal involvement. Uh, in, the in the previous video, we talked about the morphology of amyloidosis in details. And uh, in this video, we will just uh, refresh our knowledge with some new cases. We said that amyloidosis may involve all tissues and, uh, of, and organs of our body. So this is amyloidosis of the gum, just to see that it can involve any organ or any tissue of the body. This is amyloidosis of the gum. And this is amyloidosis of the lips and the tongue. And in this particular case, the skin is also involved, amyloidosis of the skin. And this is the classical feature of amyloidosis, of AL amyloidosis, with bleeding under the skin around the eye. And we said that the area around the eye is frequently involved in cases of amyloidosis. Uh, this is skin features of amyloidosis cutis dyschromica. This is hyperpigmented. It appears as see hyperpigmented and the hypopigmented areas. It appears uh, hyperpigmented and hypopigmented macules on the legs and in the back and waist, here in the waist. And this is individual blisters on the upper arm. Renal amyloidosis. Renal amyloidosis produces proteinuria. In the majority of cases, in more than 80% of cases, there is proteinuria in a variable degree. So please remember that renal amyloidosis produces proteinuria in the majority of cases, in more than 80% of cases, in a variable degree. In 35 to 50% of cases, it is in the nephrotic range. What is the nephrotic range? Is about 3.5 gram per day and in some cases it is massive it is more than the nephrotic range it is massive it is up to more it is more than 10 gram per day more than the nephrotic range Serum creatinine increases means there is disturbance in the, in the renal function. So in about half of the cases, you may find the serum creatinine increase. And sometimes there are urine concentration defects due to tubular interstitial deposit of amyloid. Remember in the previous video, we saw a beautiful case with tubular interstitial deposit. This affects the concentration of the tubules and leads to urine concentration defect and at last hypertension and renal failure please remember that in amyloidosis the most common organ affected is the kidney and the most common cause of death is renal failure renal failure is the most common cause of death in cases of amyloidosis in cases with cardiac amyloidosis, uh, it may present with congestive heart failure, may pass insidiously to congestive heart failure, or sometimes conduction disturbances and arrhythmia. 
and uh, sometimes constrictive pericarditis. About gastrointestinal amyloidosis, it may be entirely asymptomatic, but amyloidosis of the GIT may affect the tongue and may cause sufficient enlargement of the tongue, macroglossa, and an elasticity of the uh, tongue which hampers speech and swallowing, and it causes uh, mouth discomfort. This is a beautiful case of uh, amyloidosis in the tongue. And this you can see here, uh, the tongue is enlarged and there is a scalloping at the edges and the notching. This uh, due to uh, pressure, these indentations, deep indentations caused by pressure of the molar and the premolars on the tongue because of the tongue enlargement and the patient experienced oral discomfort. And the tongue is frequently involved in cases of gastrointestinal amyloidosis. Deposition in the stomach and the intestine also may occur and may lead to malabsorption, diarrhea, and disturbances in digestion. So please remember that deposition in the stomach and the intestine may lead to malabsorption, diarrhea, and disturbances in digestion. <laughs> Go to diagnosis of amyloidosis. How can we diagnose amyloidosis? We can do renal biopsy when there is renal manifestation. So please remember that. Renal biopsy when there is renal manifestation. If renal manifestation is present, we can do renal biopsy. But in, if only systemic amyloidosis, we can do rectal or gingival biopsy. So rectal or gingival biopsy in patients suspected of having systemic amyloidosis because it is easier to take rectal or gingival biopsy. We can do serum and urine protein electrophoresis and immunoelectrophoresis in cases of immunocyte-associated amyloidosis. These tests are easy and very useful. And the bone marrow aspirate in multiple myeloma. You know multiple myeloma is a malignant tumor of plasma cells, and it causes masses of plasma cells in the bone marrow. So we can uh, do aspirate of the bone marrow for easy diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Radio labeled serum amylide P component. This test is a rapid and specific test. Since uh, uh, SAP means uh, serum amyloid P component, we can do radio labeled serum amyloid B component, and this is rapid and specific test. And uh, SAP will bind to the amyloid deposit and reveals their presence. And so we can do this test. It is very good test, very rapid, very specific, and they give us. Uh, uh, idea about the extent of amyloidosis, about the uh, deposit, the site of deposition of amyloidosis, and it is helpful as a measure of the extent of amyloidosis, and it can be used to follow up patients undergoing treatment. So it is a very useful test. So we can use this test for diagnosis and follow up. It is very helpful for diagnosis and follow up. What is the prognosis of amyloidosis? The prognosis for patients with generalized amyloidosis is poor. Those with immunocyte derived amyloidosis, not including multiple myeloma, have a median survival of two years after diagnosis. So those with immunocyte-derived amyloidosis, not including multiple myeloma, so those with uh, B-cell lymphoma, this is not multiple B-cell lymphoma, or uh, plasma cytoma, that not multiple myeloma, those will have median survival of two years after diagnosis. So what about those with multiple myeloma? With multiple myeloma, the prognosis is poorer. Patients with multiple associated amyloidosis, with, my, with myeloma associated amyloidosis, have a poorer prognosis, poorer than two years. 
What about the secondary amyloidosis? The outlook for patients with secondary systemic amyloidosis is somewhat better, and it depends upon the control of the underlying condition. So please remember that the outlook of patients of, with secondary systemic amyloidosis is better than those with primary amyloidosis, and it depends upon the control of the underlying condition. Sometimes there is resorption of the amyloid after treatment of the underlying condition, but the, some cases are reported, but this is a rare occurrence. Thank you so much.